folks, let's let me welcome you. Um, if you just squeeze up to leave the gaps at the end of the row, that would be great. And uh, um, there are always seats uh, down here. Um, folks who are just joining, coming in, so let's sing as we welcome them and welcome one another. Um, singing is a really important part of what we do when we gather on a Sunday. One of the great verses in the New Testament about singing is in Colossians, that through singing, uh, the Word of God dwells in us richly. Uh, the singing that we do is, is as horizontal as it is vertical, as we encourage uh, one another as uh, Christians and bless one another. So let's sing, Here is Love, vast as the ocean, loving kindness as the flood, when the Prince of Life, our ransom, shed for us his precious blood. Let's stand as we worship God. Sunday mornings through the summer. We're looking at John chapters 14 through 17. Let me read uh, these verses from today's Bible passage. This is the Lord Jesus speaking to His disciples, the would-be apostles, the night before His death on the cross. And He says this astonishing thing in the face of what is a massive storm his death, and their observation of that. Peace, he says, I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Let me read it again. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be be afraid. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for these words of the Lord Jesus, words that the Lord Jesus, through His Spirit, caused His disciples, in this case the Apostle John, to remember and write down for our good. Lord, thank you for the power of these words. 
And Lord, how can it be that in the face of this massive storm that the disciples were about to face, that the Lord Jesus can say, peace I give you, not as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. What a remarkable statement. And in some ways, we question in our hearts if it is true. But with all our hearts, we have come to believe that it is true, because it is a promise from you in your Word. You do not say in your Word that we will be taken out of the storm. Sometimes we are. You do not say that as Christians we will be relieved from the journey through life that has scars and battles and difficulties. Indeed, there may be more because we are Christians. But what you promise us is peace through life. And it is not subjective peace. Sometimes it is our experience. We know it. We feel it. The close companionship of Christ but in this life until eternity, that can be elusive. But the peace that you speak of is factual, objective peace, because we have come to Christ with repentant hearts and sought Him for forgiveness and found salvation in Him. And He indwells us by the Holy Spirit, and that Spirit is the first fruits of our inheritance in glory. It is, and He is our companion through life, through death, to heaven, and the new creation. And so the believer can know whatever assails them in life, that they have peace with God. But Lord, in the midst of the storms, and there are many here in storms buffeted and battered and tossed. We pray that the subjective, the feeling, the consciousness of peace will steal upon their hearts as we sing, as we pray, as we read, as we hear your word preached, and in the many conversations that will ensue over the course of this day. Help us in our weakness. Encourage us in our discouragement. Lift up our hearts and bless our gathering to hear you speak and to bring you our praise. And all these things we pray in the precious name of Jesus Christ, the broker of peace and the prince of peace, and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Now, let me give you um, a very, very warm uh, welcome. Welcome uh, if you are here as grandparents of little ones. Some of you are and very much doting on them. Uh, welcome if you have uh, arrived in Edinburgh from overseas. I think we will have a family today who's just arrived from the United States to study here and uh, we're glad to be able to look after them as they arrive in this country. And uh, welcome if you were here yesterday for uh, the wedding. Uh, we don't normally have flowers like this, um, but we do because of Becca and Adam's wedding yesterday. And thank you uh, to the army of people who turned uh, a wedding venue into a church uh, close to midnight or whatever it was. Uh, last night. So thank you very much um, to you. And I want to welcome today the people who are here every week. You're very welcome as well. And uh, it's very important that um, when you come week in, week out, as many of us do, that um, we come with that sense of eagerness to see others, and others have that eagerness uh, to see uh, you. Sunday uh, Sundays are, have always been and still are my favorite day of the week, um, even though they're, they're busy days. Now, a couple of notices. Um, summer in the Psalms, firstly, 
Um, they've been great Tuesday nights as we stop our normal rhythm of small groups and all come together uh, for summer in the Psalms. Uh, this week is Psalm 147. We study it, we pray, and we have time uh, together. Um, it's been great to see loads of folks coming. Do come back. If you're back from holiday, come along there on a Tuesday night, half past seven here in the church. And then a couple of walks over the summer. Um, these are great ways to um, meet some people in the church if you're new, um, or bring people. They're great invites to come, um, this time with, um, with, with food, um, catering to all tastes, pizza or picnic. Uh, Monday, the 25th of July. The one common denominator is Portobello, which is a little bit like Barbados, if you're, uh, <laughs> if you're unfamiliar with Scotland. It is. It's a um, beautiful um, part of the world. Um, two walks on Mondays in Portobello, and uh, more information was in the weekly email on Friday. Um, if, if you don't get that, just simply email um, the church office, um, Naomi at chalmerschurch.org, and we'll connect you up with that, and um, also contact Wendy Don. I'm going to get Wendy to stand up. Um, turn around, Wendy, so we can see you. Um, if you would like to go on the walk, Wendy and Nigel actually live in near Portobello, so they're the people to speak to. Um, but please do take advantage of these opportunities, especially in the summer, because it's quite a lonely time through the, the summer for people. And then lastly, um, this coming Friday at half past two, we join together as a church family to give thanks to God for the life of Dick Anderson. Um, many, many of you uh, will want to come. Um, many of you Dick spoke to, um, and you spoke with him. At half past two here on uh, Friday, we'll be celebrating um, his life, but most of all, we'll be celebrating... Um, the grace of the gospel and heaven. Uh, Dick wants us to celebrate heaven because that's where he is. And uh, it'll be a good time together, half past two on uh, Friday. I'm going to invite the McBurney family to come up, all of you, if that's okay. It's a regular conversation going on down here with me. Keep it up. Have you come? Now, this is Scott and uh, Debbie and Aidan is the biggest. Seth is next. And uh, Lucas, Lego man, is the little one. Now, these folks are coming into formal membership of the church today. They've been with us just a year. And uh, it's been a very... Uh, special year for them and for us as we've really bonded very quickly as partners with them. Uh, on the 15th of August, um, we will commission them as gospel partners of Chalmers to go out into a part of the world. We can't say where, many of you will know, but we send them out on the 15th of August as a family. Uh, on that day, there'll be a picnic in the park just up the road but any opportunity we can have to have them all up here so we can see them and etch them in our minds and pray for them as they go overseas, uh, the, the better. So, um, mum and dad are going to come into formal membership of the church family here, and they will do so by answering these uh, questions. And if you can open the order service, you can see them. Now, you guys, Aidan and Seth and Lucas, I think you will understand a lot of what's in these questions. And in your hearts, if you believe these things, well, that's a wonderful thing. That's a wonderful thing. So don't be afraid to say, well, I believe these things too. But we'll not make you say it out loud. It's a bit scary, isn't it? So, Mum and Dad, Scott and Debbie, do you believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you believe that the Old and New Testaments are the inspired Word of God and the supreme rule of faith and of life? Do you acknowledge with a repentant heart that you are sinners and in need of forgiveness? 
Do you believe that Jesus died in your place, taking the punishment from God that you deserved? And are you trusting for forgiveness solely in his death? And therefore, do you believe that your salvation in Jesus is due entirely to God's grace and mercy, and in no part to your merits or to your efforts? Do you believe that Jesus rose from the dead and lives today? Do you believe in spiritual resurrection at conversion and bodily resurrection in the future, where you will live and reign with Jesus in the new creation? Do you acknowledge Jesus not only as your Savior, but as Lord of your life? And do you believe in the work and power of the Holy Spirit, enabling you to live a life in accordance with the Lordship of Christ and under the authority of the Word of God? And therefore, with respect to this expression of Christ Church, this local church, Chalmers, the first question's a, a little bit strange for you, so I'm going to rephrase it. Do you promise to meet regularly when you're here <laughs> with your fellow Christians as part of this church family? And do you promise where you're going in the world, and it will be very different from this, about as different as it could be, to seek out and meet with other Christians in whatever way you can? Do you promise as God gives you grace to be faithful in daily Bible reading and prayer. I'm going to add another question. Do you promise to teach these guys and keep teaching them about Jesus? Do you promise to give generously of your time, your gifts, and your money for the work of the gospel in this church and beyond? And do you promise to share your faith, telling others the gospel? of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this question to us is no more emphatically expressed if people are going to the other side of the world than if they're here, but it is an important question that we promise to support and pray for them. I want you to take a picture of them, not with your phone, but in your mind, because they're about to go into a very, very difficult part of the world. And they need our prayers and our support and our love. So do you promise to support and pray for Scott and Debbie, Aidan, Seth, and Lucas as part of this church family? Yeah. Right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the McBurney family. Thank you for bonding them to us and us to them in a very special way over the past year. And we pray that they would make good as they stand and depend on your grace these promises that they have made. And we pray, Lord, that you would love them, care for them, guard them, and keep them as they set out from this country to go back to where they call home and to serve the Lord Jesus. Lord, we pray for these words in John's Gospel that we read, that the peace of God, which is not the, as this world gives, will be their daily companion, their daily help, and their daily strength. Lord, bless them, guard them, and keep them. And all this we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Thank you. So we're going to sing again the song, Our God is a Holy... Uh, God, we're going to sing it twice, David. David's going to give us instructions. And let's all stay together, sing this song with all the children here. After that, at the end of the song, um, our children's groups will run for anyone uh, in uh, primary school up to school year P7. That's um, primary school. We'll leave for the groups. Teenagers will stay in here. And uh, lots of people here this morning with kids who are not used to being here or here for the first time, please take your kids up to the back and somebody will take you to the right uh, group for your children. They'll be well looked after and have great fun. David, over to you. For And it's God is a holy God. And it repeats that quite a few times through the song. So the question for the boys and girls is, do you think we should allow the older boys and girls to sing it with us? Yeah. What do you think? This boy thinks yes. Should we do it? Should we do it? Yeah, let's do it. 
Okay, so Rosie's going to sing with the girls, so all the girls sing with Rosie, and then all the boys sing with me. And that means all the boys. I'll be watching you, all right? Okay, so here we go. Because of our sin, God is a holy God. God is a holy God. We can't be friends because of our sin. We can't be friends because of our sin. Jesus died to wash us clean when we put our trust in Him. arms and welcomes us in. God opens holy God. God is a holy God. We can't be friends because of our sin. We can't be friends because of our sin. God is a holy God. God is a holy God. We be friends because of our sin. Jesus died to wash us clean when we put our trust in him. God opens his arms and welcomes us in. God opens his arms and welcomes us in. His arms and welcomes us in. God opens his arms and welcomes us in.
Okay, folks, let's um, come back together. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Let's come back uh, to, to our seats and let's be quiet again. And Claire, Claire Percival is going to lead us in our prayers for others. Claire. Good morning. Today we're going to be praying about the gang warfare in Haiti, the Global Missions Group, and Anya Serduk, one of our mission partners in Nicaragua. So let us now come before the Lord. Loving Heavenly Father, we bow before you this morning, bringing our prayers and petitions to you, knowing that you hear us and that you care for what is on our hearts. You love mercy, and you tell us in Isaiah to learn to do right, encourage the oppressed, defend the cause of the fatherless, and plead the case of the widow. Father, we lift up the situation in Haiti and the warring gangs in Port-au-Prince. We pray for the thousands of innocent people who were caught up in the terrible violence and who have been left without food and water as a result. We ask for your light to shine in this very dark and bleak situation and for those who have been unsettled from their homes or lost a loved one to, his violence, to this violence to turn to you. Please help those organisations involved in humanitarian aid to have free and safe access to be able to help the sick and injured and to provide the support that is so badly needed. Father, we pray for those involved in the unrest and that the government support of some of these gangs would also cease. We ask that the root causes of poverty, corruption and fuel shortages could be addressed and that a peaceful resolution could be swiftly put in place to help this impoverished and politically unstable country rebuild itself. We know that your intervention is needed and strong and wise leadership is required. We pray for strong Christians to be raised up to positions of leadership who would be a good example of integrity and give witness of you to this broken nation. We pray for the increasing number of Christians living and working in Haiti and ask that you would strengthen their resolve and faith in the face of the violence and difficulties. May tools such as Christian radio and church youth programs be used to great effect to turn young people towards you and away from violence. God of justice, we pray that the security and judicial systems in Haiti would be shaken up and that a fair and honest approach be taken to enable justice to be brought to the situation. Lord, we thank you for the biblical vision of Chalmers Church to reach, build, train and send. Thinking of sending and Jesus' great commission to go and make disciples of all nations, we thank you for our mission partners and the work they do in spreading your word and sharing your love in the places where you have put them. We give thanks for the behind-the-scenes support they receive from the members of the Global Missions Group under Jay and Mary Robertson's leadership. We pray for the group as they seek to encourage and walk alongside the mission partners. Help them to be faithful in prayer for the partners. Give them wisdom as they encourage those who are interested in pursuing a global missions role. And Lord, we thank you for the years of faithful service of Graham and Morag Boyd on the group and pray that you would provide new people to come and take their place. We thank you that Anya is now halfway through her year in Nicaragua and for all that she has been able to get involved in at the school and in the community. First Peter tells us that each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. Lord, we give thanks for Anya's gifts and the way that she has been able to use these as she lives and works in Nicaragua. We give thanks that she has enjoyed a break with friends visiting from Edinburgh and for the safe travel and exploring they did together. As the new term starts, we pray for fruit at the school and that Jesus would be known as a kind and loving saviour. Please give Anya vision, energy and patience as she faces a busier term with extra teaching responsibilities. Please sustain her as she strives to work well for you and continue to keep her in good health. Lord, we know you have plans for each of us and we pray that you would guide Anya as she makes decisions about what to do at the end of the academic year in November. Anya continues to be worried about the war in Ukraine and the impact this is having on friends and family, and we pray along with her for peace and a cessation to the Russian aggression. Thank you for the provision of visas and homes for her family in Edinburgh, and for the practical care and love they have experienced from Anya's church family here at Chalmers. We ask for protection and safety for those still living in Ukraine, and for the Christian leaders who seek to provide the guidance and care so desperately needed. 
We pray all of these things in Jesus' name and thank you, merciful Father, for hearing our prayers and for the confidence we have in you. Amen. Thank you very much, Claire. And as folks come back in now, uh, Louise Rogers, um, part of the church family here, has just gone out to Nicaragua. She's come back. She went to visit Anya, and Anya sent back um, some coffee for Nicaragua for us to drink today. So, um, uh, whatever you think of our normal church coffee, <laughs> today's coffee is the real deal. So, thank you, Anya. Thank you for Louise bringing that back. Now, we're going to sing again, or Creatures of Our God and King. And then Simon Burton is going to read, and Jay will preach from John 14, 15 to 31. So firstly, all creatures of our God and our King. reading today is from John chapter 14 verses 15 to 31 and this can be found on page 901 of the Black Church Bibles. If you love me you will keep my commandments and I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Yet a little while and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? 
Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced, because I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it takes place, so that when it does take place, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me, but I do as the Father has commanded me, so the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us go from here. reading for us. Um, if you're new or visiting this morning, just check my microphone's on. Hang on a second. Be all right. If you're new or visiting today, really glad that you've been able to join us. If you haven't met before, my name's Jay. I'm one of the um, ministers here. And it's our practice here to work our way through, uh, it's our practice here to work our way through um, parts of the Bible um, for about sort of half an hour or so, we'll be looking at this passage. Two things that will really help you as um, we go through. One will be just to have the Bible open. It's page 901. Um, and just to see it in front of you as we look at it, that really helps. Uh, but also just on the back of the service sheet, just try to summarize the main things that we're going to say this morning just to help you. And if you'd like to make notes, um, feel free uh, to do that. Let me pray as we come to this part of God's words. Our Father, we um, see in this passage that you have sent your Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, to us. And Lord, we pray then, as we look at your truth this morning, uh, that your Holy Spirit would work in our hearts, that we might come to know and understand the truth, uh, but Lord, too, that that truth might change us, uh, that we might become like your Son, the Lord Jesus, and love him. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, I wonder if you've ever struggled with the fact that you can't see Jesus. Do you ever think, look, it would be much better if we had Jesus here in the flesh speaking to us right now? Now, some of you have heard me preach before, and you're like, absolutely, that would be better, um, if only. Uh, but it's a common question that we have. It's a really common question that children have. Why can't we see Jesus? You know, he's there in our in our Bible story books, we look at him, we pray to him, but we can't see him. Why can't we see him? And it's a question that continues for many of us. Surely it would be better if he stayed on earth and was just visible to everyone. And that question's really heightened in our modern age and culture that we live in, which is so materialistic, isn't it? If you can't see or hear or touch or taste or, or smell it, then if we can't measure it in some way, well, it cannot be. It cannot exist. It's fiction. And some of the young people who we've got in here this morning with us may well experience this at school. People think you're just out of your mind to believe in a Jesus fellow who just can't be seen. We're troubled by the departure of Jesus. And Jesus himself knew that his first disciples would be troubled by his departure. And when you think about it, perhaps they'd be more troubled than we would be, because, well, we've never seen Jesus in person, but they have. They spent three years with him, he taught them, he trained them, and they depended on him. And now it's time for him to depart. His leaving for them is even more troubling. 
We heard last week John 14 begin uh, with these words, let not your hearts be troubled. And if we were paying attention, we may have seen that again in our reading this morning, verse 27, let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. So the whole of John 14 is about Jesus preparing his disciples for a future without him physically present there with him, with them. And he's doing that in order to prepare their hearts, to settle their hearts. Now, there are two departures in view. It's the night before his crucifixion, that's departure one. He's going to depart to go to his death on the cross uh, for sins, for our sins. And then he's going to rise from death three days later. And he's already told them that's going to happen, but he mentions it again in verse 19. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me, he'll appear to them. Because I live, you also will live. That's departure one. But beyond that too, there's a more enduring departure. He's going to leave this earth after his resurrection, ascend to heaven to be with his Father. And again, that's mentioned in our passage in verse 28. I am going to the Father, says Jesus. And verse 29, And now I have told you before it takes place, so that when it does take place, you may believe. So what we have here then is good news for people troubled by the physical departure of Jesus. If you've ever been troubled by the fact that you can't see Jesus in the flesh today, if that's ever been a question for you, if that's ever made you anxious, particularly maybe when other people have mocked you for believing in him, Well then, listen up, because Jesus has got some really good news for us this morning. Here's what that news is. His departure means that we who love Jesus gain the tremendous privilege of the arrival of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. That's what we're going to be looking at. And the service sheet, just um, on the back there, I've just tried to pick out for us the various blessings and privileges that we Uh, we have, that those who love Jesus have when uh, he sends the Holy Spirit to dwell in them. Now I'm going to use the phrase, those who love Jesus, to describe disciples of Jesus. That's how Jesus describes them uh, in this um, uh, little bit of his teaching. It's a great question to ask people, not just do you believe in Jesus, but do you love him? I wonder if I asked you that, what would you say? Do you love him? And that love, of course, is not merely what you say, but proved what you, by what you do. And Jesus mentions that repeatedly in this passage. Verse 15, first of all, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Verse 21, Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. Verse 23, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Verse 24, whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. And we become disciples of Jesus by faith alone, by believing in him. And Jesus has said that actually in verse 1. He says, believe in God, believe also in me. We're saved by faith and then only by grace. It's not because we're obedient that God saves us. But Jesus here reveals to us that being a disciple of Jesus is not merely to believe in him, but it's those who love him and therefore obey him. They keep his word. And for those who do love and obey Jesus... Jesus makes an astonishing promise. Let me read verse 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you really is quite something. Jesus is departing 
But he says to those who love him, I will ask my father and he will give you another helper. The word helper there is a difficult word to translate. It essentially means someone who comes alongside you, who, who speaks words of encouragement to you, who helps you, strengthens you. But notice the words, another, another helper. So who's the first helper? Well, it must be Jesus. So Jesus is saying, look, this coming helper will be one just like me. But he will never depart from you. He'll be with you forever. Who is he? Well, he is the third member of the Trinity, God, the Holy Spirit, here called the Spirit of Truth. And I think Jesus calls him the Spirit of Truth here to establish that connection between him and this Spirit. Jesus has just said that he is the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. And now he says the Spirit of Truth is going to be given by the Father to those who love Jesus. Notice too just how clear Jesus is that this is a unique privilege only given to those who love and obey him. The world will not receive the Spirit, he says. It cannot, but you, my disciples, you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. It's a truly remarkable promise. Jesus' departure means that his spirit, the spirit of truth, comes to live in each person who loves and keeps his commandments. If you'd lived 2,000 years ago in a particular place, a particular part of Israel, well, then you could have met Jesus face to face for a few years. And that would have been wonderful. But in reality, only a few people could do that. Only a few could know him personally. But now, as Jesus departs, he promises that anyone who loves him in any place, in any time through history, from that day on, anyone can experience in his heart the very presence of God by his Spirit. Isn't that amazing? And in the next few verses, Jesus lays out for us several of those great privileges which the giving of the Spirit brings to us. And I just want us to pick them out from the text as we go through. So first of all, the first privilege that this giving of the Spirit brings to us is so that we might have and know the truth. So we've already noted that Jesus calls the Spirit here the Spirit of truth. Uh, Later on, chapter 16, Jesus will say that the Spirit bears witness about him. And verse 25, Jesus says to the eleven this, These things I've spoken to you while I'm still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Now Homer Simpson once said to Marge, Every time I learn something new, it pushes some old stuff out of my brain. And that's definitely my experience. You can ask uh, my wife if you want to know. <laughs> Our human memories are leaking like a sieve, especially when there's lots going on in our lives. And so there's a risk here that the disciples, well, they might just forget these critical teachings. They, of course, don't have a, a smartphone they can just record it on. And to be honest, if you've spent any time looking at the disciples, you realize that actually they're pretty stupid a lot of the time, and and they don't always seem to understand what Jesus is saying. So verse 26 is really important. It teaches us that one of the primary tasks that the Spirit will complete after Jesus' departure is to enable the apostles to recall and understand everything that he's taught them. That through the Spirit, Jesus' words are recorded in the scriptures by the apostles, people like John, who are uniquely tasked to record them. Now, we don't have that same task. We're not going to today gain some sort of new special revelation from the Spirit about something that was previously unknown to God, uh, unknown to us. Uh, There's something that God wants to tell us. That's not our job. But this is actually even better. We now live with such a privilege 
Because we can be absolutely confident that we have the truth. What Jesus says here in John's Gospel and and the rest of uh, the New Testament, he teaches us that it's accurately recorded. It's what God says to us. We can know that Jesus speaks to us today through his Holy Spirit-inspired words that was written by the apostles. And indeed, that same spirit of truth lives within our hearts to give us assurance of that. That's the first privilege, that we know and we have the truth before us. Second one is this. The spirit is given so that we might know that we are adopted and loved by God. Now, the language of family is all over uh, this passage. And we all know just how important it is to belong to a family. And we all know just how painful it is to lose someone uh, that we love. Uh, My own father, he lost his dad when he was just four years old as a child. And even now he's pushing 80, he will still mention regularly just the effect that that had on him, the impact that it was on his life. To, To lose someone like that is such a big deal. Just see how Jesus refers to his departure in verse 18. See how it will be felt by the disciples. Jesus says, I will not leave you as orphans. They'll have this sense of abandonment as Jesus goes to the cross. But he won't leave them that way. I will come to you, he says, referring to his appearance to them after his resurrection. Because I live you also will live. And then he goes on to explain to them that after he appears to them at his resurrection, they'll then begin to comprehend the access that they gain into the family of God through him. Verse 20. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Now, when we hear that, it's a little bit confusing. What's he saying here? Well, just just notice just how close the connections are that are being spoken of. The connection that Jesus has with his Father. But not just that, the close connection that his disciples now have to both Father and Son. I in him, you in me, and I in you. We gain acceptance by God the Father as if we are his son, because we are in his son by faith. And then more of the same, verse 21, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Those who love Jesus they begin to experience the adoptive love of the Father and the love of the Son for them. Now, how is this possible? Asks one of the disciples, Judas, not Iscariot. It was a bad idea to be called Judas during that time. You can imagine him at the party. You say, oh, you say you're one of Jesus' disciples, so what's your name again? Oh, it's Judas. Oh, that's a bit awkward. Um, not that Judas, the other one. You know, he needs to just call himself Jude or something from now on. Judas, not Iscariot, uh, he asks this. Well, look, how is our experience as your disciples, how is that going to differ to anyone else's? Verse 22, Lord, how is it that you'll manifest yourself to us and not to the world? And here we get this astonishing statement Verse 23, Jesus answers him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Did you hear that, brothers and sisters? We will come to him and make our home with him, says Jesus. See, far from being spiritual orphans abandoned by Jesus, those who love Jesus have God himself make his home in their hearts. 
with all that that implies, that we're adopted, that we're welcome, that we're known, and that we're loved. God sets up home in our hearts. How is it possible? Well, we've already been told in verse 17, by the Spirit who dwells with you and will be in you. What an astonishing privilege that God himself, dwelling in us by his Spirit, that we might know that we're adopted and loved by him. And one final privilege the Spirit's given for, verse 27, so that we might have peace. In 2007, a group of 23 Christian missionaries from South Korea were captured and they were held by, for 40 days by the Taliban in Afghanistan. And they were all held together for a while and before they were then divided up into threes and sent into different locations. Uh, later on, a deal was reached between the governments and they were freed, but uh, before that, two of them had been executed, uh, one of them a pastor of the church uh, that had sent them. On the last night they, they were all together, before they were divided, they, they tore up the pages of the one Bible that they'd smuggled in so that each of them would have a bit of the scriptures uh, that they could read when the guards weren't looking. One of the survivors later wrote about that night and he said that that night each of them surrendered their life to God and told him that they were willing to die for his glory. It's astonishing courage. But here's a remarkable thing. In this situation, which is, it must have been truly terrifying, it's hard to imagine something worse, the survivor said that he experienced the presence and peace of the Holy Spirit like he never had before, and he never has since. He said that, in fact, when they all meet together today, they long to experience the Spirit like that again. They had such peace that night that they even had an argument over which of them would get to die first. How can anyone ever get to that level of calm, settled peace? It isn't natural, we might say. And we'd be right. It's supernatural. Look at what Jesus says in verse 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. The Spirit of God given by Jesus brings into the heart of a person such peace. It's my peace, says Jesus. The peace that Jesus has in himself poured out generously into our hearts by his Spirit. Why? So that we might not be fearful or anxious. Isn't that just what we need? And not merely for times of real severe crisis or persecution like for those South Koreans and indeed for the 11 that Jesus speaks to here. Don't we need that kind of peace for every moment as we look out onto our world and we see what's going on out there? Or for each moment as we face the uncertain future of our lives? And maybe you've come this morning you're just deeply unsettled by something that's going on. And I know some people here this morning are facing some really difficult things at the moment. Let Jesus' words be a comfort to you. With the gift of the Spirit, we can know real, supernatural, Jesus-like peace. My peace I give to you, he says. And he says to you, as he said to them, let not your heart be troubled, neither let them be afraid. And we might stop there, but there's just a few verses left that we're going to cover. So in John 14, we've seen the, the troubling departure of Jesus. But knowing that 
he, we would feel that way, he, he explains to us that as he leaves, there will come the comforting arrival of the Spirit for those who love him and obey him. But there is an obedience in this passage that we haven't talked about yet in the final four verses. And it's the obedience of the Lord Jesus to his Father. So verse 28 to 31, as we come to the end of this section, Jesus gives us even more reason to accept that his departure from this world is a good thing. He says in these final verses, it's good that he goes back to his father, that that his disciples would rejoice in it if they really loved him, verse 28. There is perhaps just a slight rebuke there. They've only been thinking about Jesus leaving them from their perspective of the loss that it would mean for them if he goes. They haven't considered at all the gain that it would be for Jesus. And it's much gain for him to be restored to the side of his father, who is greater than him, says Jesus, greater not in terms of his deity, but in his sense of authority, that, that simply that, that he is his father and he is, and Jesus is the son. Be great gain for him. And sometimes we can just be really self-focused, can't we? We can, we can think, well, how's what's happening you know, affecting me and, and what God is doing affecting me, not thinking at all about what would bring him the most joy or uh, the most glory. We do need that little rebuke. Jesus loves his Father, and he's seeking the Father's will and glory. He finds his joy in that, and that's what we should be seeking also. His going to the Father is a joyful reunion that should be celebrated as gain for him, not counted as loss for us. But he wants to say even more. He wants to say that this love that he has for his Father is so great that he will go to the cross for us. That's what the note, uh, the note on which this teaching ends. Jesus has said to us, look, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. But he's no hypocrite, is he? Teaching one thing and doing another. He doesn't require of God's children more than what he, God's son, is prepared to do for his father. Verse 30 and 31. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me, but I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. At the cross, it it looks like events are spiralling out of control, and it looks like an absolute disaster. It appears that evil has won, that Satan, the ruler of this world, has triumphed. But it's not true. Jesus is not compelled by evil power over him. He has no claim on me, says Jesus. I look down at his last words. He says, rise, let us go from here. Well, where are they going? They're heading to Gethsemane, where Jesus will be arrested. The events of the cross don't happen until Jesus is ready for them. See, he and his father are in absolute control, even at this moment in history when it couldn't look more like evil has won, when the body of Jesus is about to be crucified and dead and buried. If there were ever a moment in history that it appeared that God had just left the scene, well, it was then. If there were ever a moment in history to be troubled or anxious or afraid because we couldn't see God, well, it was then, wasn't it? If there were ever a moment to wonder whether God really loved us, well, that was the moment. But it wasn't so. Jesus obediently goes to the cross, not out of compulsion, not forced by demonic powers, but because of his love for his Father, who has sent him into the world to save you and me. As we close, here's the big implication for us from what we've heard this morning. For disciples, for those who love and obey Jesus, it's verse 27. Do not let your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Jesus' departure is a good thing. His departure to the cross 
was in loving obedience to the will of his Father for our salvation. And his departure to the Father after the resurrection meant that he could send his Spirit to live in each of us forever. And by the Spirit we have and know the truth passed down to us by the apostles. By the Spirit we know that we're adopted and loved as he makes his home in our hearts. And by the Spirit we can know perfect peace. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father, um, as we look at this passage, we see ourselves in the, in the lives of the disciples, sad that you have left, uh, your son, Lord Jesus, has left this earth and we don't see him now. And yet, Lord God, we do believe what he has taught us, that it was good news that he's come back to be uh, with you. And we thank you so much for the gift of your Holy Spirit, that we might be confident in the truth of your word, that we might know that we're part of the family, that we're loved by you and your son. And Lord God, that we might know that peace that you give to each of us, because you're in control of all things. We praise you for this this morning, and we ask that you'd help us, uh, that as we think on these things over the course of the day and over the course of the week, that we might believe them more and more, and that we might know deep in our hearts your presence with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as we come to the end of our time together, we're going to sing a final song, and a song that just helps us to reflect on the work of the Holy Spirit in the, in the life of a believer. Um, Holy Spirit, living breath of God, breathe new life into my willing soul. Bring the presence of the risen Lord. That comes directly from this passage, that the Lord Jesus and the Father make their home uh, in our hearts. Let's stand and sing. Once again on earth, God.
really glad that you've been able to join us. Uh, really glad that you've been able to join us this morning. Um, we'd love you to stay for tea and Nicaraguan coffee. Um, feel free to go to the back and grab a drink. If once you've got a drink, if you could please move away from the, the area, um, either back down here or, or feel free to take your drinks outside um, just so that others can uh, gain access to it um, as well. And please do uh, come back this evening if you're available. Uh, half past six tonight we'll be looking at our final part of our series in, in Habakkuk. Uh, Freddie Hogan will be uh, preaching to us. Uh, please come and join us uh, this evening as well. Otherwise, we look forward to seeing you again soon. Let me pray. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes. Sorry, yes. And if you would like the opportunity uh, to pray with someone, um, that will be made available for you at the front. A few of us will be around at the front here. And uh, if you'd like to pray, uh, please do uh, come down and pray. Let me pray now. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen.